alunos, né? Então, por exemplo, ah, pois, então aparecem assim, os alunos. Sim. Ainda os alunos estão e é muito... Sim, sim, sim. Nós, nós, eu acho que devíamos sempre, pode ser justificado a pôr aí a graça para ir para o Mas nem uhum. que seja um coisa de borracha. Só para... Pomos a graça para ir fazer o aluno de ver as pessoas a falar. Ou a dizer que eles fazem pela introdução. Exatamente. Aí, Moderado pelo professor. We are, we are online, so now we you should not. Ok. <laughs> Am I doing anything? So, uh, welcome. Sorry. We are very pleased to have with us uh, Professor Sarah van der Velde from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, Sarah is a sociologist and a demographer, and she will talk uh, us about uh, the issue of female uh, genital mutilation with examples from African countries, right? So uh, the presentation will be around 20 minutes long, and then we'll have some time for comments and questions. So people who are also on YouTube, you can post your comments, and we will we will uh, forward them to to start. So please, I can start. Yes, please. Okay. <coughs> Should I stand up or sit down? If you prefer to, to stay, well, to sit down. I've never sat down, so maybe I'll do that for one. Yeah. I usually stand up and I walk around a lot. So okay, I usually do research on gender differences in health and mental health, and I um, quite often. Mm -hmm. Do the person told me that one works really well? Oh, yeah. I am. Then it's okay. We can do it. Um, uh, I usually apply a multi level approach, which means that I look at how, if you live in a certain community, the fact that you live there can have an effect on your own health. Uh, and while I was starting my current job, I noticed that there is a data set called the Demographic Health Surveys, which I don't want to say too much, because that's like a big open source for good research to do multi-level analyses. And one of the topics of Demographic Health Surveys collects information on is on female genital mutilation or cutting. Um, and um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I started doing this research, because there's a lot of interesting things on the topic, and there's a lot of data that hasn't been explored. So today I would like to talk to you about uh, what female genital mutilation or cutting is. Why I use a combination of the two is because the practicing communities um, of female genital mutilation think of mutilation as too much of um, a negative word. It seems like you're um, yeah, violating um, the, the daughters in the community, while cutting is a more neutral word um, within the international community. That's why they use a combination of the two. So they talk about FGMC as a a shorter version of it, um, and I will talk about the medicalization of that practice. Um, I'm actually presenting research that is done by one of my PhD students, Nina van Ekers, um, and I will come to some concluding remarks. So let's first look at what FGMC is. Uh, I understood that uh, the people that are present here already had a couple of seminars on it, so I can quickly go over it. The most important thing that you need to know is that usually when we think of female genital mutilation or cutting, then we think of the most extreme version, that is that the female genital organs are completely stoned, which is type 3 of FGM. Uh, however, that's actually a type of uh, FGM that is less prevalent. That's actually rather an exception and good. It's mainly practiced in uh, countries such as Sudan and Eritrea. However, type 1 and type 2 are much more prevalent. Um, and the research where I focus on, which is, or the context where I do my research on is um, Egypt and Kenya, there it's mainly type 1 that is uh, practiced. What is type 1? That is removal of the clitoral um, and of the hood around it, or a variation of those two. Also important to know is that there's also a type 4, which is actually something that is non-invasive, um, and that is uh, by some organizations uh, posed as an alternative, where, for example, uh, communities are encouraged to not do any procedures but only prick, for example, or to do some, um, some variations that don't have a very invasive um, effect. So this is where the practice is performed. As you can see, it's mainly focused in the African continent, with some of the countries such as Egypt having very high prevalence rates. Uh, my mother's generation, so the birth cohort that was born in the 50s, 60s, in Egypt, every woman was uh, or underwent a procedure. 
Well, nowadays in Egypt, it's about 50-60% that it underwent procedure, so you do see a lot of variation in the prevalence. Um, but the most important thing is mainly concentrated in the African con continent and in some Asian countries, including Indonesia. Um, in Europe, um, it's mainly performed within the diaspora, so the migrating communities. Um, and you have a big community of migrants, mainly from Sudan, from Egypt, from Eritrea, from Guinea, from Kenya, uh, that actually uh, still want to continue to practice while they are uh, they have migrated within Europe. So many of um, general practitioners and uh, OBGYNs are confronted with the practice through those communities. There's a lot of health risks um, associated with the practice, uh, short, both short-term, long-term, and psychological. It is a very severe procedure. Uh, it has no health benefits. It's important to know that. Um, so it, that is one of the reasons why the international community has actually uh, made a lot of effort or put a lot of effort in trying to um, get rid of the practice. What they did early on is to, uh, for example, if countries wanted to get a loan by the International Monetary Fund, then they were forced to also install laws against the practice, or otherwise they would not get uh, those loans. And that resulted in many countries actually implementing laws against it, but not really doing anything with laws. Um, and the early campaigns against FGMC were also really much heavily focused on the health risk related to the practice. So you had like pictures like this one, where they say stop female circumcision, it's dangerous to women's health. So a lot of emphasis that was put on the health risks associated with the practice. What we know about the practice is that it has, depending on the context, it has a strong association with tradition. It's something we do because we do it with the culture, with religion. Some people think it's associated with Islam, it's not. It has been colonized by Islam in some countries, but it predates Islam and it's also practiced by other religions, such as the Christian community in Egypt or uh, another religious community, for example, in Kenya. Um, the most important things for me as a sociologist is that it, is a, it has a really strong relationship to gender norms, to how people think women should be, and it's quite often a prerequisite for women to, get, to be able to get married. That is one of the reasons why the practice keeps on continuing, because you know, if your daughter is not cut, she won't be able to get married. And that means that she has no economic opportunities. So many women do this, or many practicing communities continue this practice because they know that is one of the things they need to do in, in order for their girls to get married. It is also a rite of passage in many communities, for example, not in Egypt, but it is the case in Kenya, for example. Uh, where the entire community watches what is happening and it is like the, they do it right before a girl is being able to get yeah to marry someone else mothers are the primary decision makers as is the case in many um, other medical decisions in african countries uh, it's mainly mothers who decide whether money is spent on the child's health um, and whether or not a certain procedure is done and this is also the case with fgm so uh, mothers decide on this all on their own, maybe with their mothers-in-law, maybe with their own mothers, but it's something that is done within the female community and that is mainly not discussed with the male community uh, within those practicing communities. Um, daughters themselves are often perceived as too young to make this decision themselves, particularly in context where the procedure is performed at a really young age. Um, in Egypt, it's usually performed between the age of 8 and 12, in Kenya a little younger, but uh, usually it's daughters have no decision on whether or not the procedure needs to be done. Um, yeah, and the other important thing that we know is that mothers also, if they don't do this, if they don't have their daughters undergo the procedure, then they, are, they themselves are also cast out of the community. So they really look down on if they don't um, have their daughters perform the procedure. So it's also kind of a way for mothers to secure their own social position within the community by actually having the procedure performed on their daughter. Um, what we also know, this is not my own research, this is the background, is that mothers who have obtained a higher social position, either through having obtained a higher level of education or being able to um, get their own income, that those type of women are less likely to support the practice and also less likely 
to have their daughter undergo the procedure. And this is what you see in communities where women are getting more empowered that the procedure is disappearing. And this is because they get a higher awareness of those health risks that are related to through the practice because they're able to read, for example, those campaigns, or they're able to watch TV, uh, but also through schooling and so on. Um, and more importantly, they also have alternative sources for empowerment, which makes marriage less essential. So for example, in Egypt, you have a whole new cohort of young women who are not getting married and who don't need the cuts in order to get married because they don't see marriage as something essential to their life anymore. So the thing with these types of campaigns, they used to be really popular in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s, where the international community really put a lot of efforts into trying to stop the practice and also local communities is that they really emphasize the health risks associated with the practice. But one of the problems with those campaigns is that uh, practicing communities didn't, well, they did stop it to a certain extent because you see a decreasing prevalence of the practice. But what you mainly see is that um, the procedure is increasingly being performed by medical professionals. So they take away the health risks or they think they take away the health risks, because that's also important to know, um, but they continue the practice. Um, here you see this in um, the overall, you see a decreasing trend of female general cutting in the different Egyptian uh, governments. So in some of the governments you see, for example, in 1978, almost in all of the entire female population was cut. On 2014, in some of the governments you see that it dropped to less than 20% or less than 30%. So you see an overall decreasing trend in female general cutting in Egypt. But what you also see is an increasing trend in the medicalization. Sorry, I left that slide out apparently. Um, so what you see is within the community that is practicing or within the people that are actually being cut, is it's increasingly done by medical health professionals. Um, so this is what we refer to as a medicalization of female genital cutting, that is where the procedure is performed by a health care professional wearing a public or a private clinic at home or elsewhere. Um, this medicalization, however, is strongly condemned by, in, in, by the international community because they fear that it leg legitimizes the practice, which means that it is perceived as less dangerous. And as a result, it might result in the practice just continuing. Um, and it's, yeah, the fear that it may contract all of the other efforts that have been done in order to, to yeah, eliminate the practice. Uh, and, as a result, and as a result, the anti-FGMC campaigns have shifted their focus away from health risk. And nowadays, you see much more uh, focus on human rights. Or, for example, is something that has been do, that has been done in Kenya is where they start to focus on sexual pleasure because that is something that the men in the community are actually interested in. So that's one of the newer um, focuses that they have in these anti-FGMC campaigns. Here you see where um, the medicalization of FGMC is highly prevalent, and you see that that when it comes to medicalization of FGMC, that's really concentrated in the small sample of countries. Highest rates of medicalization are found in Kenya, Sudan, Egypt, Nigeria, Guinea, and Indonesia. In my own research, I focus for that reason on Egypt and Kenya. Egypt because you have good data sources there, and Kenya because you have a really interesting case where you have different ethnic groups, with some of them practicing the practice, um, some others not. For example, uh, the Kisi community and the Maasai really uh, have high prevalence rates of FGMC, but only in the Kisi community, there's also high levels of medicalization, which makes it a really interesting context. These are the rates of medicalization. The blue ones, no. The, the yellow, that's like a typical question. The, the dark reds to yellow are prevalence rates, and we mark the blue ones as where there's high levels of medicalization. So, this is where we were at the start of our own research topic on the medicalization of FGMC, because most of the research up to the point where we started to do research on this focused on attitudes or prevalence, but did not focus on medicalization. And we wanted to know what's going on, who is medicalizing, why are they medicalizing, and so on. 
So the research objectives of our uh, project was to examine the association between these medicalization trends, um, between the medicalization trends and the girls' risk of being cut. Because what the international community says is that um, if there's high levels of medicalization, that means that uh, prevalence rates won't go down because the medicalization legit legitimizes the practice. Um, and this is like the the basic idea on why international communities oppose the medicalization of the FGMC. But there was actually no empirical knowledge on that. So we wanted to examine that in detail. And then we wanted to see whether the strong association that was found between the mother's social position and that of prevalence and attitudes also holds for medicalization of FGMC. And then we did some qualitative research to really understand what was going on. So let's first look at the association between uh, the medicalization trends and the prevalence trend. And what we did was we used the Egyptian demographic health surveys. Um, and I, I've, I was looking up which waves we used, but I don't remember and I forgot about it this morning to look at the details. But we got data that dated back until the 1950s. We used the discrete time event history analysis method, um, which is a complex method that uh, allows you to examine what the effect is of a previous rate on the risk of being cut. Um, and what we examined um, in more easy words was we looked at the percentage of girls cut by a medical professional in the previous birth cohorts. And we used that to predict whether the girl that is at risk of being cut is actually also cut. So imagine you uh, having a daughter that is currently you need to make the decision, the decision on whether or not you want your daughter to be cut. But you live in a context where either a lot of other girls are being cut by either a medical professional or by a traditional um, circumciser. And the two contexts, what we did was we examined how they predict the girl's risk of being cut. So this allows us to examine whether medicalization actually influences decreasing prevalence rates or not. I don't know if that's clear. Yeah. So what we see here is that the medicalization percentages were increasing in all governance. So this is among those who were cut. You see that in all governance in Egypt, the percentage that was being the percentage of procedures that was being performed by a medical professional was actually increasing from the 1982 until 2014. But what we also saw is that in governance with high medicalization percentages, so in governance where more than 40% of girls were cut by a medical professional rather than a traditional circumciser, that in the subsequent birth cohorts, uh, that girl's risk of being cut decreased. Um, so that's an important finding. That means that the entire idea of the international community and the entire foundation of international anti-FGMC campaigns of, you know, really um, being opposed against FGMC, that there was no empirical ground for that. Because apparently, decreasing prevalence trends go hand in hand with increasing medicalization. And we saw that this effect was even more pronounced if uh, medicalization levels were higher. So the more girls were being cut by medical professionals, the less likely girls were uh, cut in the subsequent birth cohort. Um, and this was even more pronounced if the mother was higher educated. So this suggests that the increasing medicalization trends exist within a decreasing prevalence trend. And here you see this. For example, this is um, uh, the overall risk. And you see um, the X uh, axis as the regional medicalization rate. Um, which goes from 10%, which means that only 10% of the girls that were cut were cut by a professional, by a medical professional, that goes up to 90%. And there you see the risk of a girl that is being cut um, by the age of 12 years old. And you see in regions where you have only 10% of girls that were cut by a professional, uh, by a medical professional, you see that the risk of being cut was much higher than if the majority of girls was cut by a medical professional. So here you really clearly see that um, the increasing medicalization trends goes hand in hand with the decreasing prevalence trends. Any questions about that? Right on. <laughs> no? 
Then we look at the second uh, research objective, which looks at the association between a mother's social position and her decision to medicalize her daughter's cut or not. Uh, again, we use the Egyptian Demographic Health Survey, but um, while well, previous research really looked at, um, for example, uh, the mother's level of education and how it associates with the risk of her daughter being cut, um, what we did was we examined um, the social position of the mother with the risk that the daughter was cut and with the risk that the daughter was cut by a medical professional versus a traditional circumciser. But also what we did or what we added to the literature was that we not only looked at educational level, but we really used an, a comprehensive measure of female empowerment because in context such as Egypt, there's a lot of women who don't get an education, but who are, for example, within the household, able to already decide on whether or not to spend money on groceries or whether or not they're allowed to go outside on their own. So there's the, the current literature on this topic was really using a European American um, measure of um, female empowerment and we try to make a more local measure of female empowerment because of course it's not only about what you are able to do outside of the household but also how much power you have within the household. And what we found is that, not very surprisingly, but that medicalization was associated with a higher socioeconomic status in mothers but also with if the mother had a higher social position within her household. So this is actually an argument for people who work in the global south to not only always focus on education and work, but also look at um, power that women have within their household. Uh, but what we also found was that a higher social position was even more uh, strongly associated with completely abandoning the practice, rather than to opt for a medical aspect. Why did we think that? These are potential explanations, so this is the discussion part. This is, there's no evidence for this yet. We thought maybe because a higher social position in women is associated with better access to medical institutions and resources, they're, they're able to pay for the procedure. Uh, they're more aware of the health risks. They're more experienced with dealing with medical professionals. For example, many of those women also went to a hospital to birth, which is something that usually isn't done in Egypt. They usually do it at home. They have a greater ability to travel outside of their community to a hospital or to a doctor or they're more likely to live in urban areas where medical institutions are concentrated. They're also more likely to spend research on children and very important, and this is something we found in qualitative research later on, is that the medicalization on its own is also, is becoming a status symbol for those women. They are perceived as modern mothers. And this is something you also see, for example, in research in Brazil on C-sections, where rich, um, highly educated women really go to hospitals to have their child through a C-section because that's perceived as something modern. You don't do a natural birth because that is something for the, the less modern women. It's uh, actually being perceived as uh, something modern if you have the procedure done by a medical professional. The, sorry, doesn't yeah? this, these results show that probably in the first study, the, the high rate of medicalization is uh, related to higher socioeconomic status of the population. Also, yes. So maybe the relationship isn't, ex isn't related to medicalization, but to socioeconomic status of the group. Right? Yeah, well, two of them, both of them. Because this is actually the, the next one looks at what uh, you're proposing, and the last one looks at what the other thing. So it's, it's a combination of the two. So what we did then was we, um, in the next step, we looked at if you, because what, what you're talking about is a composition effect. Mm -hmm. and we really wanted to know, is it a composition effect or is something else going on? And in this paper, we looked at that. So we uh, applied a multi-level analysis to see if, if you live in a community where the vast majority of women also is highly educated. For example, is it just a composition effect or is there something else going on? If you have a lower level of education, but you live in a community where everybody has a high level of education, for example, maybe you're also more likely to do it because you, you pick up on it through the community. So that's what we did. We uh, did multi-level modeling. Um, it's kind of complicated to explain what we, exactly what we did, but what we did was we looked at the governance, and then we looked at the previous birth cohort, and then we looked at the number of girls that were cut, and also the number of girls that were cut by a medical professional. And this is the um, reference group that mothers use at the moment that they have to make the decision themselves. 
And then we examined whether the reference groups, the bigger community, had an influence on their own individual decision, regardless of their own position. This is pretty much what multi-level analysis does. It looks at whether there's an additional effect above and beyond your own uh, individual position. So it's not just a compositional effect. And what we found is that the, there's a higher likelihood to opt for metabolized cuts rather than a traditional <coughs> cut in regions where high percentages of young girls were recently cut. So this is from the previous birth cohort. And also in regions where high percentages of women were cut by a medical profession. Why, why would that be? Because many of those women uh, apply a harm reduction strategy. So many of the, for example, if you're a higher educated woman who lives in a region where the majority of women still have their daughters cut, um, then we checked whether they, what their attitudes were towards the practice. We found that those highly educated women were more likely to oppose the practice, but instead of not having their daughter cut, they would opt for a medicalized cut because they see it as some kind of, um, I forget the word, a compromise between actually not wanting to have the procedure, but doing it in a way that it's safer, but still um, um, following the traditions and the norms within the community where they live. So those women who want, uh, there are women who want their daughter cuts, but, or do not want their daughter cuts, but they look for less harmful ways to do it anyways, because they want to conform, or they're, they're part of a social pressure that is present in the community. And the other thing is that medicalization is becoming a norm on its own. Many of those women don't see the other option anymore. This is less the case in Egypt, but this is particularly the case in Kenya. Then in the last research objective, we looked at why those, so we did qualitative research with women in Kenya. Why did we focus on Kenya? Because we wanted to do both contexts. And we also intended on doing qualitative research in Egypt, but then Corona happens, so we're not able to go to Egypt. We're actually doing this in September now. Um, but so these results are a bit strange because I presented research results on Egypt and now I move on to Kenya, um, which is a bit of a different context. But anyways, we did, we did qualitative interviews with women in Kenya um, and we asked them pretty much, why do you opt for medicalization, medicalized cut? So in-depth interviews with women from the Kisi community in Kenya, the Kisi community is a pretty high social status community. Well, in terms of how high social status can be within, within Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, FGMC is a rite of passage, which is less so in Egypt. In Egypt, it's more of something individualized um, and strongly associated with marriageability, um, as well as with ethnic boundaries. So what you see there is that, for example, the Kisi community wants to differentiate itself from other ethnic communities in Kenya by saying we do female general cutting, this is a practice that we do within our own um, community, and that way we're better than other communities who are promiscuous and do stuff that is not okay with them. Um, it's, in Kenya, it's also usually accompanied with a social event, which is not the case in Egypt, so it means that the community comes together and women are, uh, or girls are being cut while other women look at it, so it's something that is strongly controlled within the community. Um, wherever in the last decade you see a, a really noticeable increase in medicalization of FGMC. The other context that you need to know is that there is an anti-FGMC law in 2011 um, that was implemented in 2011, and that is actually being controlled by the Kenyan government, which is different from the Egyptian government. The Egyptian government kind of, it, it doesn't um, allow for female genital cutting, but it's not actually punishing people for it either. Uh, while in Kenya, this is really the case. So people really have to uh, really watch out whether there's no police or anyone else um, who's, yeah, keeping an eye, an eye out on whether the practice is happening. Um, and in this study, we asked women uh, what motivated them to opt for a medicalized cut. And what were, what were the reasons that those women gave themselves? So these are all the, all, all the women that were interviewed were all women who had a daughter who was really recently cut, so within the last two years. And all of them stated, well, we want to reduce health risks associated with practice. That's the main reason why we do it. But the funny thing is that if we ask them who does it, then quite often is, for example, the wife of someone who works in a hospital who puts on a white coat and acts as a doctor. So there you really have the phenomenon of 
pseudo medicalization where people pretend that they're doctors um, uh, and yeah, ask more money for it and so on. Um, it has also really become a community norm. So traditional practitioners no longer exist. Nobody knows where they are. Um, it's, it's pretty much the only way to do it. But more, this was something that we thought was really interesting is that um, because they go to medical doctors, that means that um, they have to go somewhere to a hospital away from their community, so no longer in a public place, um, <coughs> which means that it's no longer a social um, activity or social practice. It's something that is done away from your community. And if it's done by a medical professional, it actually also quite often means that the healing process is shorter and the seclusion period is shorter as well, which means that a lot of those girls <coughs> are being cut without the community knowing that they're actually cut. Which is good. I have something in my throat. <coughs> which is good for um, the families because they still want to do it, but they can do it in secrecy. Um, the thing is, though, that this has resulted in it becoming a privatized practice, um, and there's less community control on whether or not girls are actually cut, which means that most people don't even know whether or not the girls are actually being cut. And some of the families, this creates an opportunity for some of those families in the community to actually stop the practice completely because nobody knows it is happening. Hold on. <laughs> so there is no more an intent and so on. No. It's disappearing. There's no one. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why most respondents expect that the practice will actually disappear. And we have like uh, nice anecdotes as well of, for example, mothers who are saying, well, my daughter was telling me, you're not going to do this because otherwise I'll, I'll tell the police that you want to cut me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the mothers uh, say, okay, no problem. But then the grandmother takes them to the hospital anyway. So there's like a lot of, there's something going on. But the most important thing is the medicalization is happening because it is a way of doing it in secret. But because they're doing it in secret, it's actually also kind of the, the, the biggest value that was added to the practice is actually also disappearing. So that explains why that medicalization is going hand in hand with a decreasing prevalence of health. Well, that and a lot of other things. So here you see the FGM Act of 2011 increased the secrecy of the practice. And the secrecy of the practice, well, the need to do it in secret, the need to do it in secret can be achieved through a medical intervention by going to a medical professional, which makes it more invisible, which shifts the social control. So older generations no longer know if the daughter is actually being cut, which decreases the prevalence of the practice. And also it becomes a more individualized practice. So here you see really nice how that medicalization, the increasing medicalization trends is associated with decreasing prevalence trends. So the conclusion, uh, why do mothers opt to medicalize their daughter's cuts? Because they believe that it will reduce a possible health risk related to the practice. And again, I want to accentuate, however, that in practice, especially in contexts such as Kenya, this is not always the case. It's quite often pseudo medicalized um, um, medical professionals. Uh, and they, those mothers quite often look for less harmful ways to do it uh, within a context where, where it's still the social norm to perform the practice. So that's a harm reduction strategy that is also applied in other contexts within the medical field. And that medicalization of FGM actually acts as a data symbol on its own, particularly in Egypt, where you see that uh, women. Well, the most highly educated or the, the women with the highest social positions stop at the practice, but then the, the ones in the middle go for medicalization to, to distinguish themselves from the women in lower social positions. Um, medicalization in some of the contexts has also become the norm, so it's the only way to perform the procedure, and it helps to continue the practice secretly. However, it does not counteract efforts to abandon. Here are the references. As you can see, all of the first names are Lina van Eker, so I don't want to run with the glory of this research. It's actually her who has done this, and I'm her supervisor. Um, she's continuing to do this, and then for postdoctoral research, she's actually doing qualitative research in Egypt, and, with, and there she will focus on intergenerational differences, so the influence of mothers-in-law, 
and the own mothers, well, the mothers of the mothers of the grandmothers are the procedure. <coughs> so that's it. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Questions? Not yet. Uh, then I ask a question. Is there, um, do you have any, any insight about the opinion of the doctors? Who are the doctors who practiced it? What is their opinion? I don't, but I have a study starting now on Kenya where we are going to interview doctors. <coughs> um, I work with Samuel Kimani on that project and we haven't interviewed doctors yet. So I, I can only say what he's saying, and he's saying that one of the reasons why they do it is because they are part of the community themselves, so they believe in the practice. It's also a way of gaining money, uh, especially in Egypt, where you have a second, well, like a black market. It's something that is still performed a lot, and many medical doctors do it after hours, after working hours, and they earn a lot of money with it. Um, but doctors are actually also um, one of the gatekeepers, because they're also the ones who can actually inform mothers about the health risks and so on. So they're actually also partners in the fight against it. But more I cannot say. Then I have also a kind of more technical question. You you mentioned the, the social position of the woman within the family. How do you measure that? So um, what we did was we used Young's concept of um, the social position of mothers in Egypt, because Egypt is an Islam community, uh, well, there's a small part that's Christian, but mainly Islam, and the indicators of women's position within the family there, I think by heart, so I have to really think about it, but for example, their decision-making power um, towards money, and that's measured by, are you allowed to um, decide on how much money you spend on groceries, and are you allowed to do it by yourself, or with your partner, or can only your partner do it, and like a lot of other things that you're allowed to spend money on, such as medical um, expenses of your child, um, so that's one of them. Um, then there's also an indicator on whether or not you're allowed to move outside of the house by themselves, or whether they need to be accompanied by someone. Um, there's a measure on um, supportive attitudes towards um, female violence. So there's a question on, do you think it's okay for a man to beat a woman if he knows she's not doing the dishes and so on? Um, let me think. What is the other one? The age at marriage is also one of them. So the younger, the, that's usually an indicator of lower levels of empowerment. Well, I should have to say lower levels of social position because empowerment is something else. Um, and the age of first birth. Should you have in these surveys, you have a lot of questions about this kind of yeah. yeah. And these surveys are performed every every four years. Every four years. They're uh, they're sponsored by the Prop Council, um, and they're done in many. Well, I don't want to make too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't tell, want to tell too much about it, but they're really good surveys that are done in most of the African countries and most of the low income countries as well. And they're every four years. And then UNICEF also repeats them every other four years. So in between, uh, those are the mix, which focus on the children's health and have a lot of indicators on maternal and paternal health. And it's open access. Yeah. You can just request this data yeah. and you get them. Yeah. Yeah. There's, of course, a lot of drawbacks. It's collecting data in the global cloud. So it's not the same as a European Social Survey or the EU mm -hmm. itself, um, because you have to go to communities and really knock on doors and so on. Uh, we have the same with qualitative data as well. If you go to Kenya, then we have to really knock on doors and ask them if you want to. So it's it's less than ideal, and it goes hand in hand with the typical things that, that don't work in European context either. Uh, but those are really high quality data, though. and they have a lot of good reports on quality, non-response, who responds, why, why, like, yeah, good data, look at them. And most researchers use them on HIV and so on. So you have plenty of questions about health. Yeah, but they're called the demographic health survey.
So I think anything on contraception, even abortion, as one of the really sensitive topics, are included in the paper. Yeah, and they also have them for Eastern Europe. So, for example, you have the Gender and Generations Park. I don't know if you know those data. Also, good data in Europe, but that's Western Europe, and then the demographic health surveys mirror that in Eastern Europe. Questions? No? Okay. Um, I, I have the same question that about the social cohesion. So you um, complete several uh, questions yeah. about the empowerment of women. Yeah. And then you define the uh, high versus low cohesion. No, we didn't do that. We did not make an index because, um, well, I'm a big, I, I like validity of uh, indexes. And we would never get a valid index. So what we did was we included them, um, well, we checked for multicollinearity, which was not the case always. Mm -hmm. um, and if it was the case, then we made factors out of them. So we did make indexes out of some of them, but not all of them. And what you saw was, that's a nice thing. It's not, like many studies use education as a proxy for the social position of women, but that is definitely not the case. Also not in Europe either, to be honest. Um, and so we include different indicators of uh, women's social position separately into the model. Okay, uh, so in the internet nobody asks questions? No? Because people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Sarah. So if they ask a question, then I will give them a fun answer. <laughs> Just to know if they're, you know, I have this story. This makes me always read every PhD. Someone once told me that he wrote in his PhD, if you read the sentence, then I will give you a big bucket of beer. <laughs> so, I'm so scared that this will happen to me. That's why I always read every sentence every PhD. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your presence here in Lisbon again, once yeah. again, again and again, and interesting presentation. Thank you for having me. We, we, are, we are not so used here to, to hear about studies made in low-income countries, so I think it's, it's very enlightening. Okay. And that this data exists. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I don't know what I need to do. Do I need to do anything? Bye. <laughs>